Dive In. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Vitajte na festival Dive In. Welcome to the Dive In Festival. Dive in. Bienvenidos a Dive in. Welcome to Dive in. Mabuhay sa Dive in Kapistahan. Üdvözlünk a Dive in Festivalon. Dabro pasalvet na Festival Dive in. Buhay mabayim. Bolit Floritano. Dive in Utsabe. Apna de shokol ke jalay. Shadol amontran. Benvenuti al Diving Festival. Diving Festival in Hoshkadis. Thank you and good evening to everyone. And thank you for devoting your evening to spend time with us uh, talking about white privilege and how you might use it for positive change. But we're delighted you've joined us for the Dive In 2020 Festival. Uh, it's now in its sixth year. There's been over, or there will be over 100 events hosted virtually in a record number of 35 countries, making it one of the largest festivals globally. So good evening. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brian Kaur. I am a diversity and inclusion advocate. I'm an executive coach, but I also work for the Financial Conduct Authority. I know many of the people here are in the insurance industry, so you'll be delighted to know that I am not here in that capacity today. Um, it's an honor to have been invited to co-facilitate this session with uh, a good friend, the wonderful Dr. Doyen Atawoligan, um, an internationally recognized expert on leadership, diversity, intersectionality, and organizational culture, director of Delta Alpha PSI, a leadership and consultancy uh, about uh, on inclusion, psychologist, scholar, advisor, regular media contributor, multi-award winning, and recently included in People's Magazine Top 20 Diversity and Inclusion Power List for 2020. So, Doreen, would you like to say hello to our... Thanks, Ryan. Lovely uh, to work with you on this. Really looking forward to hearing from our panelists and getting some great questions from the audience. Thank you, Tony. So I would also like to thank our panelists for joining us. Um, I'm excited to hear from these powerful thought leaders on diversity and, and, and have great lived experience and insights to offer us. And I, I'm really excited to get to the main panel discussion, but you'll hear more of them later. But I do want to give you a little insight into uh, what you've got in store and the calibre of the people you're going to have a chance to listen to. So Afua Hirsch, a British journalist, writer, broadcaster and former barrister, regularly writes reports and speaks on race, identity and belonging, a documentary maker on race issues and colonial history, a celebrated author included uh, the, the book British that covers race, identity and belonging, uh, Athua, um, if you'd like to say hello to our audience. Oh, Athua, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Brian, for that warm introduction. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And I'm also really looking forward to the conversation in the presence of such a diverse group within this space of equality, diversity and inclusion. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Athua. And next, I'm going to introduce uh, Lady Phil, Executive Director and Co-Founder of UK Black Pride, Pride Celebration for the People of Colour and LGBTQI plus community. Uh, Executive Director of Kaleidoscope Trust, an organisation working towards the liberation of LGBTQI plus people around the world. Uh, advisor to organisations who want to work effectively in service of the LGBTQI plus community. Uh, and public speaker focusing on race, gender, sexuality and class. Uh, Lady Phillips. Hi, thank you, Brian, and thank you, everyone. As Afua said, I, you know, wonderful to be on this panel. And also, I am definitely looking forward to the conversation, learning and unlearning. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Lady Phil. Um, and also, next, I'd like to invite Stephen Louis, 
Barrister at Garden Court Chambers, mentor with Urban Synergy and Duke of Edinburgh LGBTQ Youth Programme, trustee of Out to Swim, an LGBTQI plus uh, aquatics club, and a public speaker on race, ethnicity and sexuality. Welcome, Stephen. Good evening. Welcome, Brian. Um, Honoured to be here and very much looking forward to hearing from the audience. And then last, but, but certainly by no means least, uh, Alwyn Swales, an executive coach and partner at PwC, leads PwC's consulting Colour Brave initiative, who looks at addressing issues of race in the workplace, a public speaker and advocate for minority ethnic groups. Alwyn, welcome. Thanks, Brian. Good to, good to be on the panel and looking forward to an exciting time together. Super. Thank you, Alwyn. So, as I said, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm sure you had many options and choices of things to do for the next hour and a half. I doubt anything would be as exciting and interesting as what you're about to experience. So thank you for making that choice. I won't let you down. Let me tell you a bit about what to expect. So in a moment, I'll share a little bit of my journey uh, towards my understanding of white privilege and what I decide to do with it. Uh, Doyen's going to help us uh, understand some of the very common terms that are used around the discussions in this space. And then we're going to have a panel discussion. You're going to have more opportunity to hear from the panel members where we're going to pose a few questions. But you also get an opportunity through the Q&A uh, section to really, as things come up in your mind, please post those questions. We're going to be able to only take a selection of those. Otherwise, we would be here, I think, till 9 o'clock tonight, and we want to honour your time. Um, and then we are going to get a close, a close from Doyen and uh, Lady Phil. So... That's what to expect. What do we ask of you? We ask that you listen actively. Um, we're going to have a few polls, so we're going to get you to be a bit active, um, give us some insight. We're going to be able to bring those polls up quickly um, and be able to make a comment on those. We'll also ask that you think, as you go through this, what might be one thing as a result of the time that you're going to spend here you might take away and do differently tomorrow. That might be a conversation. That might be an action. That might be um, going to find a book to read. It might be... Uh, whatever you think is going to be the right thing for you. Um, the reality of this conversation is um, people are going to share their lived experiences. Uh, some of that is going to be uncomfortable to hear. And what we would ask is you stay with that discomfort for as long as you can. Please do look after yourself as well, because it may trigger uh, thoughts or feelings in yourself. But please stay with that, because I believe that in those moments of discomfort, you may well find um, some real insights and learning. So why, why does this conversation matter? Why is it useful to be having this conversation now? So the murder of George Floyd, uh, Amy Cooper's actions in Central Park, the Black Lives Matters movement has brought front and centre the issue, issues of racism, uh, prejudice and injustice. And racism and prejudice have a long history, um, but for the first time, I think for many white people are beginning to understand it is happening. It's happening in the UK. It's happening daily. It happens to your friends and colleagues, and when it happens, it hurts. Not just the people, but it hurts the potential of what this country uh, can deliver. And I think also what's happened is it's opened the mind to people that they have the privilege of never having to uh, endure or even devote thought and emotion towards having to deal with racism or prejudice on a daily basis. Now, privilege and... Uh, prejudice both take many forms. Prejudice can be based on race, gender, sexual orientation or social class or many other aspects. And it is a global issue. We see injustices around the world. Um, we've seen a lot of reporting on things that are happening in America. Um, more close to home in Poland, we see the fight against LGBT free zones. Um, and I think what's happening is many people are getting a glimpse from colleagues who, who share their lived experiences about what it might be like to be uh, black, Asian, or from a minority ethnic group in the UK and, and live in that experience. And, and, and if those uh, stories uh, weren't enough, there is a lot of evidence-based uh, reports uh, on the impact of racial prejudice, be that the Lamy report uh, on uh, prejudice in the criminal justice system, be that the McGregor report about uh, race uh, prejudice within the workplace. And earlier on this year, uh, shortly after the George Floyd murder, uh, I published an article on LinkedIn to try and share what I thought I could usefully bring to the conversation, which is my own story, which was how I understood white privilege better, um, 
uh, really to offer insight, inspiration, and ideas. Um, I won't go to all of that now, um, but I will share a few thoughts. So I get that as a white heterosexual male, I am privileged. Why? Because I don't have to think about or endure the feelings of hurt from daily experiences of prejudice. I don't have to use the energy and emotion that must take to get through the day every day. And, you know, there are many levels in which I know I'm privileged, but I don't have to turn around to my son and daughter and prepare them for the experience of uh, what racism will mean and why someone might have uh, ill feeling towards them for no other reason than the colour of their skin. Now, those facts about me that clearly don't tell my whole story. It doesn't mean I've had it easy, and it doesn't mean I don't deserve my success. But what I do know is the colour of my skin, my gender, and my sexual orientation certainly has not made my path harder. And I know that I've benefited from unconscious and conscious bias in my career. I have the luxury of being able to walk away when things get uncomfortable, uh, when we talk about issues around race. But I have a choice. We all have a choice. Uh, I choose to do the work to better understand. I don't believe it's uh, black people's responsibility to help me understand. I've read books, I've attended events, I've joined networks. These are all things that are available to you. I choose to take uncomfortable, imperfect action. It's not easy at times, but I get also that my discomfort will be minor than minor in comparison to having to live with prejudice on a daily basis. And I choose to own my privilege and use the energy that affords me uh, and the status it gives me to be an ally. And as Brittany Cooper so eloquently put it, um, I also choose to uh, encourage other people to become allies because she said, don't bring me your tears, bring me your people. And I think that's an important part of how we, we create uh, change. Why do I care? I care because in my head, uh, I've always been brought up to believe in justice and fairness. Uh, in my heart, I come from um, Irish immigrant parents uh, and my mother back in the 80s, uh, for those um, that will remember those times, because she has an Irish accent, she, it was implied in one conversation that she was an Irish terrorist, which made me angry, and I thought, how dare someone judge her just on the basis of her accent? Um, and then I think not only my head, not only my heart, but most importantly, my hands. I put my hand up to get involved in things when I didn't know how I'd be able to support, and I've learned far more than I could ever learn. Uh, or I can never contribute and give back. So part of this conversation is about what can you do. Um, I would encourage you not to look away. I would encourage you to lean in, um, but to go further and lean in and leap in. I'd encourage you to listen, engage, um, advocate, and take purposeful action. I believe that together we make up our society, so it's a combination of our daily choices about how we think and behave that can move us away or towards a just and equal society. And if you are a leader in your business, you should look around and look at your team, your department, your organization, and ask yourself some hard questions about whether you see diversity uh, in, your, um, in your population of staff. But importantly, if you ask any one of them, do they feel that they are included and have a voice, what do you think their answer would be? So no one wants pity or platitudes. I think part of uh, the job of privilege and having power is to stand beside those who are fighting for parity um, as we go forward for a better society. So that is me just giving you an insight on in, uh, hopefully a, an introduction to the, the areas that you want to talk about. But um, And no doubt we're going to hear so much more as we go through the panel discussion. But what I wanted to do was um, reflect with Doyen. Um, some of the language in this area becomes uh, sometimes emotive, sometimes misunderstood, sometimes misquoted for the benefits of not trying to engage in the topic. Um, so, Dorian, it would be it would be great if you could help us understand a bit better about some of the commonly used terms. And, and, and let's start with uh, microaggressions. Yeah, just um, there was something odd with the sound, so I think we're okay now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, microaggression. So that's one word that I think a number of people who are um, underrepresented in various uh, contexts in society would relate to. There are small everyday reminders that that difference that you have isn't valued 
Examples at work might include talking over you. Examples in school might be uh, mispronouncing your name. Um, examples in leadership roles might be other people taking credit for your work. Um, but these things happen really small, really fleeting um, environments or circumstances. And the challenge with microaggressions is that because they're so subtle, um, those people at the receiving end may actually begin to even question whether those events actually happened. Thank you, Dwayne. And I heard, I heard Rob Neal uh, once describe it as they're like paper cuts. And the first one, you know, anyone that's had a paper cut knows they hurt, but you don't pay that much attention to it. If you had multiple paper cuts, sooner or later that becomes very painful. Um, and after a while, you can't use your hands. So um, I thought in a useful analogy, but let, let, let's move on to other words. So assimilation. Assimilation is about people who are minority um, or minoritized becoming part of the majority um, through pressure or oh, that might be implicit, it might be explicit. It's because there isn't enough room for you to be different. Um, so this requirement or expectation to fit into the norm actually sends the message out that that difference that you have isn't valued, isn't counted in that particular context. Assimilation is hard, it takes effort. Um, and I think that's one of the things, again, if you are part of the majority group, um, you undervalue or underappreciate the energy that's required for that. Thank you, Doreen. And, 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 and similarly, I've heard it described as the difference where the, the difference of having to wear a mask all the time to try and fit in, whereas if you're in the majority, and, and certainly if I look back over my career, I, I've definitely not had to invest any energy in that space. Um, white privilege. That's the topic of this conversation, and we'll be uh, starting a poll on that in due course. So just a heads up to participants to look out for that while we continue the conversation. And white privilege, Brian, you talked about it. It's the um, condition of really not having to worry about the fact that people may treat you negatively on the basis of your skin color. White privilege is not socioeconomic privilege. White privilege is not saying that your life has been perfect. White, white privilege is saying your life has not been made complicated by the skin color you find yourself in. Thank you. And another term that sometimes creates uh, defensiveness when people are trying to uh, navigate this territory is white fragility. Tell us more. Yeah, that's become a lot more um, of a familiar term these days. White fragility describes any emotional reaction you might have to the realization that racism affects us all, even you as a white person and whether you have been intentional about um, it or not you have benefited from a system that puts your skin tone above others so you might find that you're angry dismissive defensive silent rejecting it all of those responses would come under the category of white fragility thank you and we've touched uh, a bit of the day-to-day -day reality of what racism you know, will feel like uh, for people of colour. But sometimes the term institutional racism it isn't very well understood, so it would be great to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, institutional racism is, um, is something that a lot of people, I think increasingly we're becoming more familiar with that term, but maybe a year ago, a number of people on this call would qualify racism as kind of direct 
uh, acts of calling people, for example, bad names and therefore say, you know, we don't live in racist times because people don't walk around generally calling me the N-word. Institutional racism actually is the fact that racist hierarchies, which um, can have significant and long-lasting effects, are embedded as normal in society. So, for example, in terms of where you live, um, you might have um, the, the, the common narrative or an unusual narrative a usual narrative that um, reflects these racist hierarchies would be something like people moving away from areas that are populated from immigrants into areas that have higher value property. So they send their children to better funded schools with higher rates of university success, leading to a chance to get a better paid job, but therefore less likely to be um, over-policed in those areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So between education and health and, um, uh, so, and justice and housing, we have patterns that separate different types of people. And I think that talks to the not only needing to think about daily behaviours, but also what are some of the institutions, structures and hierarchies that currently exist that regardless of individual changes in behaviour may still lead to the wrong outcomes for people of colour. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we've heard a lot of people uh, over time say, I'm not racist. Um, I, I've, I've certainly said it myself. Um, but it'd be really helpful to hear that distinction between you know, not being racist, but being anti-racist. And, and, and how, how can you help our audience understand that distinction? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the end, Phil, Lady Phil and I are going to be talking about calls to action, and this in some ways speaks to what we are saying. Um, just talking about institutional racism, it draws attention to the fact that there is no such thing as, you know, like merit. Um, you know, everyone has the fair chance of getting to the top because um, they've, um, they have innate potential. Um, we know that they are structures that actually sustain these inequalities. Therefore, if you don't do anything about that, in essence, what we are doing is we're sustaining these inequalities, we're perpetuating in some ways. So anti-racism is about noticing and disrupting rather than not doing anything because that in itself maintains the status quo. Yeah, and, and I've heard it described as uh, using, your, using your passion to stand up and call out. And that will be uncomfortable at times, and but continue to do that because, as you say, absent that, the structures will continue to hold the status quo. And we'll come on to a bit of that in the panel session. I just want to check in with our WebEx uh, coordinator. Um, I, I take it the poll has gone out to those that are listening. Um, and are we are we approaching being able to see the results? This feels a bit like. Um, yeah, I've uh, I was asked to reopen them, so I did reopen them again. Um, so I'll uh, okay. close them here shortly and then read us. Okay, later. brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. So just as we wait on that, we are shortly going to move into the panel discussion. I'm sure you are tired of hearing my voice. Um, you will never be tired of hearing Doyne's voice because it's such a wonderful voice. Um, but we are soon going to hear everyone's voice, which is uh, where we would like to go. Um, but those that have been completing the poll really. What that poll is seeking to do is just um, get you to pause and reflect for a moment on certain circumstances or situations where you may have given it very little thought in the past. But the reality is for either people of color or other um, groups, um, these are things that come up and, and, and do make a difference and impact people on a, on a daily basis. Um, It's like a Eurovision, waiting for your points to come in slightly. <laughs> Dorian, in your work, just as we wait, of those terms that we just walked through, are there any particular terms that you find people struggle most to get to grips with? 
Uh, uh, white fragility and anti-racism would be my vote, um, and w which is great that we have over 350 people on this panel, and we have superb speakers like Afwa Alwyn, Lady Phil and Stephen. So I think there's something about noting, listening, reflecting on your own reactions, because that in itself is telling you something. And like I said, thinking through, like you, you we asked at the start, what, what are you going to do about it? Um, and maybe just to say one more uh, reflective piece based on the poll, polling questions. Some of you might have looked at those questions and thought, well, that's such a regular point, such a regular question. Why are you asking me whether I even think about this? Um, and, you know, the, the point is that other people spend their lives um, not so infrequently thinking about this, regularly thinking through what's going to happen when I go to the, through airport security. What do I do when I'm walking down the street with my partner, for example? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to we're going to get move into the panel discussion and bring other people in. I'm going to take a look at the uh, results and I'll, I'll, I'll pass some comment on those as we go through the panel discussion because we, we can we can definitely tie it directly in. So, um, welcome panel members. Um, I'm sure everyone is eager eager to hear your views uh, and your insights. Um, the, the first question to get us going on this is uh, we are we are. Sorry, my screen has fired up loads of different things in front of me. And so we've gathered here to discuss privilege, uh, in particular white privilege, um, and how a better understanding of privilege and how it can be used and, and how it may currently create the situation we're in. How can we use that to create positive change? So I would, I would love, and I'm sure our audience would love to hear um, from each of the panel members a bit about their own lived experience and how how that's informed your view of privilege and the role it can play in positive change. And I'd like to start uh, with you, Afa, if that's okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for what you said and for your expertise, Doyen. It's great to hear. My story is one of having grown up in a very white space. I grew up in a white part of London. Um, I'm mixed race. My mother is a black woman from Ghana. My father has always been perceived as white, even though he has Jewish heritage. And I was not equipped by anyone in my life to really navigate the ways in which I found society racializing me. And when I say that, what I mean is that my parents did, as I think all good parents do, encourage me to pursue my dreams, work hard, thrive, and try to be my authentic self, and hoped that my heritage would just be something that benefited me rather than created an obstacle. Um, and my white peers in, in middle-class suburban England claimed that they didn't see race. And what they would say as a way to compliment me was, don't worry, Efwa, we don't even see you as black. And as a child, even though I didn't have the language or the tools to articulate what I instinctively felt was wrong with that statement, uh, I perceived that they had loaded so much baggage and negativity onto the idea of blackness that the best thing they thought they could do for me was to give me a way out of it. And even at that age, I instinctively knew that I didn't want them not to see me, that my blackness is also my heritage, my identity, my culture, my history. And so by making me invisible, they were offering a very powerful statement about the ways in which society racializes us and that race is an ideology which has always from its inception had content that is designed to try and diminish and degrade and oppress people of African heritage. Because I wasn't equipped with the tools or the knowledge to understand this reality, I was just living it, I had to self-educate, as I think we're all always on a process of doing, those of us who are interested in justice and equality. And the more I began to self-educate, I suppose the more it radicalized me in terms of understanding how much we've been lied to in this society. And I certainly was encouraged growing up to see whiteness as an invisible identity, something that was so normalized and centered in all conversations and all standards and ideals that it didn't even exist. 
whereas everyone else was something else. And along with that came all of the things you've been speaking about, the pressure to assimilate, to shrink yourself, to fit into predominantly white spaces, to downplay your difference. And those are experiences that I continue to have throughout my professional life. And now as an author and a TV presenter and somebody who moves in different sectors, different parts of society, different geographic locations, I see these patterns again and again. And so many people of minority heritage expressing that they do not feel that they can be their authentic self or that there is a penalty attached to that. And that sim similarly, you're rewarded for assimilating into whiteness and for trying to fit the pre-existing space. I do feel that there has been a change in recent months. I think even having this conversation, and it's often something you have to argue about, but whiteness should even be part of the conversation. Often people want to bring people of different minority heritage together to talk about what they are as minorities. And I always say, we know what we are because we've always been racialized. This is a society that has been racialized for centuries and we've all inherited that legacy. But it's white people who often haven't been given the tools or the knowledge or had the awareness to interrogate their cultural heritage, their ideology, their identity. And that in, in centering whiteness still as normal and something that doesn't need to be interrogated, you only perpetuate the problem. So I think that it's very important to have this conversation talking about whiteness. And just on the language of white privilege, I recently interviewed the author Claudia Rankine, who writes a lot in this space. And she was saying how she's experimenting with using the phrase white living rather than white privilege, because she's found privilege such a problematic word. I think the, con the concept has integrity and we can all, when we think about it and interrogate it, understand why it is white privilege. But at the same time, so many people instinctively reject it as some kind of suggestion that they have had an easy life. Um, that she uses the phrase white living to denote what white privilege is, which is that you may have many problems as a white person, but your skin colour is not going to be one of them in a society where you're part of the majority. Um, just to finish, I don't want to talk too much because I'm so looking forward to hearing from the other panellists, but I think it's important to talk about class, and I'm somebody who's had quite a privileged life and gone to a private school and uh, had access to the professions, and I think that it's both evidence of how race and class intersect but also reveals how it's such a false binary because no matter where you go in our society yeah. race will follow you. Yeah. race will follow you everywhere you go the idea that if you achieve a certain level of status or income you can escape racism is fundamentally flawed and i think that the second thing to say about that is, as well is that as somebody who's also mixed race and, and experiences color privilege and also as someone who's perceived as more proximate to whiteness because of my heritage and my skin color, I think it's always really important to acknowledge the ways in which we're not just a racialized society, but the one that's been stratified by color and class and that we all can locate ourselves within that. And I think as with all these conversations, just being honest about our own experience and privilege is a necessary essential step to really moving the conversation forward and not doing that with a spirit of defensiveness but acknowledging that we didn't create these systems we've inherited them and as you were saying about anti-racism if you want to change structural injustice and unfairness you have to see it you have to see it you have to acknowledge it and then you have to be part of the solution thank you thank you very powerful i'm sure we've all learned a lot from that and I think there's something very powerful in the fact that white people myself included I've never really had to think about my color of my skin um, and there's something powerful in the um, the view of the view of you know the fact that you've had to navigate that through your life again just reinforces that I have privilege or I have a lived experience or living um, because I agree sometimes the word privilege gets in the way but it is the reality of what it is um, and maybe we do need to change the language to open the conversation to more people, but let's let's see how it goes. But thank you. That was really, really insightful. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Lady Phil next, um, and we'd love to hear your views. 
Right. First of all, thank you very much for this invitation. And Doyen, you know, Brian, thank you for setting out, you know, language, because language is ever so important when we're talking about, you know, inclusion, intersectionality, when we're turning some of these theories into practice and trying to ensure that it's implemented in a way that um, is meaningful and not just a synonym or a tokenistic way of looking at diversity for intersectionality. Well, I, I think, you know, your question is really one which is so important. I can talk about my experience as a as a dark-skinned, black, British, Ghanaian woman. And, you know, I'm smiling because after I mentioned Ghana and I'm slightly biased, of course, um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've encountered racism on a uh, a daily basis, either whether it's directly or whether it's through, you know, media, whether it's through television, whatever that may be, and it is exhausting. And, mm. you know, just to give you an example, because I think from childhood to to now, where I find myself in certain spaces um, that I occupy, that I work within, that I advocate for change, it has shown me this trajectory of how things can change when you acquire particular privileges. And privileges for me are, I think, are very situational. So in 20, 2004, 2005, um, I went to what was our LGBTQ communities um, to really seek their their support for UK Black Pride. And those of you on the line who don't know, I am the co-founder of UK Black Pride, and I'm also um, the executive director of Kaleidoscope Trust, which works to uphold human rights within the Commonwealth space. And my work is central to everything I say about, you know, inclusion, diversity, equality, equity. Um, and when I went to these leaders within our community um, to ask for support for creating a black pride, I was told, and excuse my language, to F off and go back to where I came from. And it was there that I really learned that privilege is situational. You know, so I had had enough of that sort of privilege that I see. It's We also must mention the power dynamics that play out, those with influence and, and standing within the communities. But I did have a standing within the black LGBT community, and I say black encompassing our African, Asian, Caribbean, uh, those of the diaspora. Um, I had a standing with them. But that was a privilege that didn't necessarily extend to the respect of the white LGBTQ leadership at the time. And what I had in one space did not translate into another space. So that essential understanding of privilege was lost there. And since then, you know, UK Black Pride has certainly benefited from well-meaning white people and, you know, and comrades and colleagues in positions of power and privilege, but they have helped amplify the work, but without some, it's not come without some serious challenges to our own values and outlooks and actions. And I don't necessarily think that, you know, the role of creating change comes with tons of privilege because it doesn't, but rather those who need to understand the privilege they have is largely as a result of racist and anti-black systems, and Doyen mentioned about anti-blackness, anti-racism, that is what we do have to look at. The privileges that maybe cis, white men and women have had in order to address some of those more structural and systemic issues. So again, in my experience, I think that people who are not afraid to speak truth to power um, are those who are really, truly fed up with the system, those who want to create an actual change, who are willing to lose something to make it happen. And I remember speaking to an amazing uh, trans black activist um, in Brussels. She identifies as a trans femme activist living, uh, living in Europe. And she says, solidarity isn't solidarity unless you give up something. You have to be willing to lose something within this system, in this world, in order to meaningfully 
stand beside someone else in solidarity and she says that i haven't met many people that are willing to do that but i have met a handful and they are true allies her name is olav and i think that i you know i just want to pay homage to the work that she has been doing and speaking up you know, I also think the conversation about privilege on its own, as if it's a standalone thing, could be better helped or served by seeing privilege in relationship with action and solidarity. So the question is really, is what are you willing to lose to live in accordance to your values? What are you willing to give up so that your words don't ring hollow on the ears of those that say they're trying to uplift and amplify particular groups and I think I, I like the notion of when you started about sitting in this uncomfortable moment but also giving advice and guidance that if it feels uncomfortable um, too much or triggers off a particular emotion then sit as long as you can with it when I talk about white privilege white fragility microaggressions intersectionality where we remember the origins which is about black women I don't do it to make people feel guilty. I work within human rights. So my work is driven by looking at colonial era laws that exist that actually impact on LGBTI persons, women, gender, gender identity, intersect. And it's not for people to feel guilty because guilt is self-indulgent. It is really for people to understand that if you're feeling uncomfortable now, can you imagine what it feels like to be a person of a black, trans, you know, low income, socioeconomic, low background person, a young person that could be facing homelessness, how tired do they feel? So when we're talking about using our privilege or using privilege, or I like the term after I mentioned, you know, in the living, it's got to be about how do you elevate others so that they have the same access to health, education, housing, and other such things that we are all benefiting from. Just the notion of having, and I will, I will finish up here, Brian and Dwayne, but just the notion of having Wi-Fi to connect to this meeting I'm working with people where COVID has had such a detrimental, disproportionate impact on them that they have no money to even top up for their data. So they can't take part in this. And maybe we need to start thinking about who does have access because privilege comes in very different forms. So I'll stop there, but thank you. Lady Phil, thank you. And, and many important and interesting and useful points there but the one certain takeaway for me is being willing to lose something is where true solidarity happens and the power of looking to elevate others so thank you but there's so much more richness in in that that doesn't do justice to what you've shared with us um stephen i'm going to turn to you next Okay, so I want to identify what I see as some of my privileges. So I'm a well-spoken, educated, cisgendered male, and I come from loving, educated parents. I, my mother is a black Jamaican British woman, and my father is Jamaican Chinese. And I'm fully aware that not being fully black gives me a degree of privilege above my black mother. When I'm in court as a barrister, I notice that my black colleagues get a different reception to me. So judges assume that because I have an Asian surname that I'm smarter than my black colleagues. But when I go out of court, out of London, before judges there, they are often expecting me not to be able to speak very good English. And there's often this sense of relief on their faces when I do start speaking. What I was told by a white Oxford grad at bar school was that no matter what I achieve, I will never truly be middle class because inherent to a genuine middle class experience in the UK is whiteness. I'm also a gay man. And so when I was growing up and being told by my strong black mother that in order to succeed, I have to be 10 times better, that freaked me out because I thought, well, I'm also gay. 
and I don't know if I can be 20 times or 100 times better than others. And so I had a real sense of double jeopardy. Now, that's not to say it's been a completely rough ride, because I did get a scholarship to do my bar exams, and in that interview, I talked about an article I had written on same-sex equality, and I got a major scholarship to do my bar, and that taught me at that stage that there was a strength to being authentic. But I want to be clear that the bar is no panacea. We are a predominantly white Oxbridge organization, and the judiciary are painfully aware that they do not reflect the community that they seek to serve. And what I've noticed in terms of the jobs that black barristers do is that the profession effectively says, you black barristers will give you the criminals, the broken families, and the immigrants. But when it comes to the chancery work, and the complex corporate commercial work will leave that clever stuff to the white people with blonde hair and the blue eyes. And that is literally what you see when you click on the websites of those chambers. Now, in terms of privilege within the LGBT community, the feedback I have been given is strongly that physical attractiveness is a privilege in and of itself. Muscles open doors. And that's true of the wider society, but it has a particular potency in the male gay community. Beauty is equated with validation and sometimes moral authority. And a mixture of body types are not celebrated and neither are skin tones celebrated within the gay media or the media in general terms. Gay men of color experience racism in the community. On apps and in dating, people are told Look, I'm, I'm only really into white guys. And I, as a half-black person, I've been asked whether I'm black from the waist down. And there's a classic phrase on the apps, which is, people put this on their profile, no blacks, no femmes, no Asians, which is very, very echoing of the old sign that we used to see up of no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. And that's happening in 2020. I also wanted to talk about the fact that I have a theory. If someone could choose whether they're born a white gay man or a black straight man, I would bet my bottom dollar they would choose to be a white gay man. And so pervasive and powerful is the issue of race in our society. I also wanted to do a shout out to the issue of HIV status in the gay community. Because the reality is, is that of the 4,500 people who were diagnosed with HIV in 2018, 51% of them were either gay or bisexual. And the reality for those people in our community is that of the 48 countries that still impose bans of staying or entering or, resi or residing in those countries, those countries being Australia, Israel, New Zealand, Russia, Saudi Arabia, your colleagues who are potentially going to be posted to those countries need to consider something that you may never have to think about. And what I also wanted to say is that when you speak out about homophobia, it can be really uncomfortable, especially if you're surrounded by straight people. But it's calling out um, what's wrong effectively in those spaces, even if it's awkward, that's really, really important. And what's also important is that the younger generation within the gay community don't forget the sacrifice, the blood, sweat and tears of the older generation who are often, sadly, very, very lonely and isolated and who need to be cherished. And the last thing to say on this topic is that white members of the LGBT community need to remember that they do not have a monopoly on the community's truth. Stephen, thank you. Thank you for bringing another perspective to the concept of privilege, another set of insights that, that help us all think about help us all think about what it can look like and what it can feel like from different perspectives. I'm going to pass over to uh, Alwyn next, um, and then we're going to have one more question from me, and I'm going to look for one one sentence ish answers from my panel, and then I'm going to pass to Doyen for the Q and A. Um, and then before we before I do that, I will just give you uh, a, a few comments on the results of the poll that we ran. But 
I will. Over to you. Thanks, Brian and, and Doyen and, and the panelists. And um, um, from South Africa, a very Zulu greeting to you, Sawubona, which means I see you. And I guess that's going to be a very interesting topic to talk about as I introduce myself and my story. Um, I'm married to the lovely Patricia for almost 20 years. We have two sons, um, who are seven and eight. Um, we adopted them here in the UK seven years ago. So my life is a mix of managing uh, the demands of a very young family, uh, a demanding career at PwC. Actually, I do work in insurance, so, so shout out for insurance here. Um, and essentially, my, my Christian faith. My hobbies have been quite varied over the years, and lots of them actually have their roots in something that was to go against what I was taught growing up, but we'll come back to that in a second. I enjoy music. I'm a pianist, uh, play the acoustic guitar, the bass. Um, I enjoy training, so cycling is my latest um, focus at the moment, and for a few years also, you know, to go against what was taught to me in South Africa, I, I held a private pilot's license, um, which I really enjoy doing, is, is flying. Um, and for those who can see behind me, I have a Liverpool supporter staff. I've waited for a long time to say that, so I hope I don't offend anybody. You know, 30 years is a long time in the making to show that scarf off proudly. But yes, you are hearing a very funny accent. Um, just to clarify, I'm actually Swazi by birth. I come from a small rural village called Hluti. Lots of these complicated words. Where I lived for seven years with my folks, um, we and my brothers and I were um, sister were born. We moved back to South Africa, and 15 years ago I came to the UK. I guess on the panel, I'm in a unique position as I was born into a country where a racist ideology called apartheid was in force. The word apartheid means separateness and was only abolished in 1994 when Nelson Mandela became president. Apart hate it is what it was. The genius of it was to separate people into groups and make them hate each other so that you can actually run them all. Under apartheid, I was given the term called coloured. Now, I know in the North that is not a great word, but I'm actually quite proud of the culture, the community, the food, the music, and the diversity that it represents. My grandfather and his brother were born to a, bright, a, a white British man who took a Zulu concubine from a local chief to gain land. He pushed them all aside when his white family came to live in, in South Africa from the UK. On my mother's side, I have French Huguenot and Khoisan or Bushman mix in my grandparents. Three generations later, the diversity of my family mixed in with the apartheid laws means I have cousins in my generation that are classified black, colored, and white under these old apartheid laws. I can tell you this made for a very interesting upbringing for me. As for some people, I was almost white, while for other people, I was never black enough, even in my family. I've tried to bring this to light in three quick stories as I go through introducing my, my, my story at the end of the day. The early years, um, white privilege used for good. I grew up in a world that told me a lot about what I could not do, right? I could not do this. I could not do that. This was not for me. That was not for me. And in my township and family, whether it was the gang scene or drugs or alcohol, I wanted to plot a very different course. I guess in the UK and in the US, the stereotype is that ambitious black kids see sport as the great liberator. In my situation, education was my only ticket out of the grip of the township. So I threw everything at my schooling to get into, into university at a time when less than 2% of young black people were allowed to go to university. I achieved really strong, great A-level results, um, or A-level equivalent. I applied for a ton of bursaries, about 20 in total, but I had to attach a photo. Clearly, the color of my skin, my facial features were more of a factor in choice than my grades. So I sent several Dear Alwyn, We Regret letters. Actually, a large utility company saw the writing on the wall for apartheid in 1989 and came looking for talented non-white students in the country, just to bring up another term. I applied again, and two days before university registration had this telegram sent to me that said, bursary granted, stop. Company will pay university fees and expenses, stop. I can tell you as an 18-year-old, I was so excited. This telegram was the ticket for me to a completely new world. The second stage of my story, white privilege, a stark reality. In my first job in this utility company, 45,000 people, a large manual black labor force, only 300 of us actually having any form of post-school education, 
I used to do IT support work for power station managers where leadership, with the, and the leadership teams, where the only other person of color on the floor was the tea trolley lady or the cleaner. I remember a conversation with a white manager where I was told, Alwyn, you're a different kind of colored. You're not like them. I mean, how do you respond to that? That could have been my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, and even my sister. I guess that gave me a lot of energy to get active. And I joined the Black Managers Movement, which I then went on to chair in my second year, encouraging our execs around change and helping them think through what change in South Africa would look like. I was nominated for the Early or Emerging Leaders Program by a very supportive white senior executive who used his privilege to help mentor me. They, that exposed, they exposed me some amazing training and, and, and lots of innovative technology. Um, I could say so much more about that, but three and a half years later, I left, set, set up a business with some friends. We grew it, sold it to a listed company, and nine years later, as the chief operating officer for one of the business units, I came to the UK. So here, the last stage in my story, white privilege, do we have an issue? I guess the reason I left South Africa was that I wanted change. I wanted to experience more. What, did it, what would it be like to live in a society that was liberal, proclaimed freedom, offered black people the right to vote, would not judge me because of the color of my skin? I guess you might say I had very rosy colored spectacle view of the UK at the time. And with the challenge going on in me, I behaved a bit like a chameleon, we call it assimilation, trying to blend into my environment to be accepted. It took a very senior partner to put his hand on my so shoulder eight years ago and to say, Alwyn, stop that. Be yourself. That is who you are, and that is powerful. That was a very important moment for me the year before I made partner at PwC. I guess I'd fallen into that trap of trying to fit in like a chameleon at the cost of who I am. Sadly, almost 30 years into my career, I was saying to Doyen a few days ago, I'm deeply saddened when I see the challenges our black young people face in society and in our, in our world of work. The same ones I faced many years ago. I guess I asked myself the question, could our generation have done more? Should we have been more engaged? And I guess as I finish, I could tell you many more stories, but my five minutes is up and I can see Brian peering at me. From rural Swaziland to living in the UK and making a partner at PwC, I could never have dreamed this story would ever have happened growing up. I've experienced firsthand how white privilege can drive positive change, but I've also seen how destructive it can be when it's used to separate and to divide us. I say to the young people I talk to and to people I talk to in general, be brave, engage please, and be forgiving. Thank you. I mean, thank you, very powerful words but a very powerful story to remind us of how it can look very privileged, can look very different in different countries and different situations and different times of our lives um, and give us different uh, opportunities. Uh, and one of the topics we've talked about is the use of white privilege for change. And, and, you, and you mentioned a few people who stepped up in your journey to support you and help you help you move forward. Um, I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, so the next question is, uh, really, um, in one sentence, I'm going to ask our panel members, uh, including yourself, Doyen, and maybe I'll start with you. Um, what would be, what would you say to someone who was uh, resistant to the concept of uh, using their privilege to create better justice and fairness around them? Doyen, if I start with you, maybe. Great, thank you for that. Um, I was having tech problems, so I couldn't unmute myself. Um, what would I say to someone who wasn't ready to change? Was that what you were saying? Who wasn't quite on the quite on the change curve? Was that your question? I beg your pardon, Brian. Now you're on mute. <laughs> Into step forward and get involved in the, I suppose, fight for justice. Right. Um, gosh, so we will be uh, ending, like I said, with a call to action. So this is starting that conversation. Um, understand that it will take work. 
I think uh, many of the comments that we've heard so far, so from Phil, for example, from Afua, um, and even Alwyn's and Philip's story, Stephen's story, talk about how complex and nuanced this is. So if this is new to you, sit with that puzzlement, that incongruence, that what, it, what is this? Because it's, it's life's effort. To, to get clear on it. That's one of many, many things that can be done, and I just offer that for now. Thank you, Dorian. Uh, Lady Phil. Okay, so I think you want just a sentence. Um, it's, it's hard to speak to somebody who is resistant to something when they don't even know that they have privilege or that they don't necessarily they haven't necessarily been challenged by life's struggles as it was but there's a saying by desmond bishop tutu and it's if you are neutral in the situations of injustice you've chosen the side of the oppressor so I think whilst we're going through so much around Black Lives Matter, Grenfell, Windrush, the toxic vitriol against our, our trans siblings, um, discrimination towards LGBTI persons abroad uh, and what's happening here around youth poverty, we've got to ask ourselves the question, is this the world we wish to see ourselves in? And if it's not the world we wish to see ourselves in, then the question is, what are you going to do to change? Because Google is your friend and you can quite easily research and look at some of the things that you can do, like one, reading Afua's book, you know, two, Googling what intersectionality means. Three, thinking about what are your policies and procedures that you have in the workplace. Do they speak to being inclusive? If they don't, maybe there's some dismantling that needs to be done. But you cannot be neutral in situations where people are facing violence and stigma and marginalization to their beings on a daily basis. Lady Phil, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Stephen next. So I have been told by some of my white colleagues that there's a genuine fear from those who've benefited from privilege that if they open up the castle for others to experience equal citizenship, that it will mean that they are diminished in some way. And I want to support an understanding that there is an abundance of opportunity and space for everyone if everyone is raised up. So in my chambers at Garden Court, we have found that by actively recruiting with diversity and inclusion at the forefront of our mind, it actually has a tangible benefit of leading to a wider range of thought and expertise within our chambers. And it's a fantastic marketing tool which shows our clients that we take our values seriously. And when I worked at Goldman Sachs, I was told in very clear numbers terms that when their employees feel able to be out about their sexuality at work and celebrated, their output increases. Therefore, Goldman's makes more money. And so if our leaders understand the positive impact on productivity, then frankly, it's an easy sell. And if people are worried about raising up people of color, I want to highlight that there are some serious parallels between the struggle for the LGBT community and the struggle for racial equality. But the tricky thing about being LGBT is that it affects white people. But what LGBT white people will tell you is that when their lot was improved, society did not fall apart. And so I would suggest logically it follows that when people of color are raised up, the world will not end. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Alwyn. I guess in your question, um, when people don't want to engage or, or feel um, a massive resistance or express a massive resistance, I'm I'm always asked to I always ask myself, wh wh why is that happening? Wh wh what's in this story that's driving that? Because a lot of the times, what I found is is you know either people have 
never engage with the story so or, or with the problem so feel super uncomfortable with it or, or there is something in their engagement in the past that either has left a scar or or has gone unanswered or unchecked or unchallenged and so they they struggle essentially to to create a connection um i believe as i've just done with you that one of the ways you break down barriers barriers is is understanding why but also in telling our stories i guess I guess we can only change the minds and hearts of people around us when they when they get to know us. And I say to I say to people when I talk to them, everybody has has a story. Why don't you tell me yours, and then I'll tell you mine. Stories help create connections. Oftentimes, you know, we'll find points that we can agree about before we dis address the things that we disagree about. Um, connections break down barriers, and and I guess that's what we're trying to do with the issue of race at the moment. But importantly, you know, when you start to break down barriers, then we start to forge trust and develop relationships. And and essentially, I'd say, you know, how could somebody ever experience the richness of who you are if they don't know who you are? Mm -hmm. And so for me, there's a real power in being able to connect with people in the way we tell stories on a one-on-one -on -one basis, right? I mean, thank you, and, and I agree with the, the power of stories can can really move people's thinking and emotion, and then hopefully move them to action as well. Hathor, you've had an opportunity to listen to others. <laughs> they probably stole all of your sentences. I love how different everyone's answers have been. I'm a firm believer in the fact that racism is a nonsensical ideology. It was invented to justify something. Uh, outrageous and it continues to be totally unsustainable and dependent on a huge degree of ignorance and also fostering a fragility that people have to cut themselves off from reality in order to sustain something that really does make no sense and so when I try and reach people who are hostile to change I like to almost weaponize their own value system against their racism. So, for example, in Britain, there's this idea that the indigenous, uh, which is itself a, a completely invented concept to suggest that white people have been in Britain longer than anyone, when in fact there were Africans in Britain before there were English people in Britain, but that's another story. Um, when people say that tr the true indigenous British people are patriotic and anyone who tries to change or challenge racism really hates Britain, I like to take British people's own values. You know, if you ask British people what their values are, they'll say the proud of history, um, proud of having great universities and being known for being sophisticated and smart. Well, if you are intellectually curious, if you're interested in your history, if you like the royal family and Downton Abbey or stately homes or national trust properties, then you don't get to pick. You have to engage with the whole history. And a good example is the First and Second World War. Many British people have their whole sense of identity and Britishness built on the foundations of this idea of being the moral victim of the 20th century, having won both world wars. And when you tell those people who feel patriotic and proud of their role in winning the wars, you tell them how dependent Britain was on soldiers from West Indies, from Africa, from Asia, in order to fight those wars, how many people from those countries died serving Britain, and that when they then moved to Britain, they were penalized and treated with the racism that we still talk about today. Find people realizing that their whole ideology is unsustainable and uh, and 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 on it's uh, it's it's it can't even withstand its own set of facts. So I think it's really useful to meet people where they are. If they have a narrative about being proud of the wars, then you hit them with that. If they have a narrative of being proud of history, then you say, well, you want this history, you also get this side of it. And I think that is a way that you can make people force people almost to interrogate the conventional narrative that they've received. I want to thank you for uh, your thoughts on that as well. I think some really, and as you say, diverse ways to answer that question and, and certainly food for thought for anyone listening in terms of their own resistance, but also food for thought for everyone in terms of how they might tackle the resistance they might come across. Um, we, we, we've got the results of the polls. Um, I mean, I think I'll pull out two things. One was um, there was about 60% of people on the privilege question that you got asked earlier um, who essentially answered the question in the space of, you know, actually, I, I never have to think about that. Um, but there was about 20% who said, I do have to think about that, um, whatever that, you know, whichever the individual questions were, which, which tells us that actually most people probably haven't got a full appreciation or seen maybe uh, the experiences of others fully, and hopefully this has helped them with that. Um, and then the only other one which I would like to call out was uh, on the privilege um, 
you know, 43% of people said, I'm aware of my privilege and, and how I might be able to use it. 34% um, said, I have privilege, um, but I don't know how or, or, or where I might use it. Hopefully, you've got some ideas from this conversation. Um, and then only 4% believe uh, they do not have uh, uh, privileges. And, and because we don't know who, who the individuals or the distribution across the people, that, that might be a very fair uh, assessment of their own situation. I'm going to pass to Doyen um, to uh, take us to the next stage. We, we may not be able to get too far into the Q&A section. And apologies for that, but that's due to the richness of the panellists' answers. Indeed, indeed. Thanks, Brian. And thank you so much so far for the sharing. Um, but of course, a lot of people are listening because they want to um, kind of move forward and think through what kind, what are some of the next steps that they could take. So I've selected with um, Inyang's help a handful of questions and we'll see which we'll get through. Um, the first question is, I would love to hear Afo's take on it. Um, it's a question by Rietta Fern and she asked, uh, they ask, with Lloyds of London having acknowledged their role in slavery many years ago, do you believe that this improves the insurance industry's ability to deal with institutional racism and prejudice? Thank you. That's a I firmly believe that it's a necessary step for institutions and societies at large to begin doing the work of unpicking their history and revealing the things that have been erased or forgotten and locating themselves in that project of starting to get a fuller picture of the society we are and how we built it. So I think that's a really positive step. I would say, however, that it's necessary but not sufficient. It's not the case that if you start to unearth your history, you've solved the problem. The question is, once you have those facts, what do you do with them? How do you feed into a wider narrative? How do you, and this is always, I think, for me, the question we talk about about race and justice, how do you start to redistribute power? Because this isn't just about making people feel seen or heard, although that is a really important part of it. It's also about saying we cannot achieve change until there is a redistribution, until we have equity, until we have a change in the power dynamic. Because when we're talking about whiteness, what we are talking about is a power system that has allowed one group to monopolize power. So I'm interested in when these companies, and there are other examples as well as Lloyd's, but obviously the insurance sector has played a very unique role in this history of uh, white supremacy and oppression as its very foundations in the commoditized of black bodies, which is, it's no exaggeration to talk like that, dramatic as it might sound. I think that um, how you then use your resources to affect material change is the real question and challenge, and that is where I would like to see us heading. So I think this is a necessary first step, but it's not enough on its own. Thanks very much, Afwa. Uh, there's uh, one question and, and maybe one or two linked to this um, question I'm about to ask. I will direct it to Alwyn and Stephen. Um, and it's about the term BAME. So this is a question from Deborah Duncan Silvera. And Deborah's saying, I'm a black British woman. And I really dislike the term BAME, B-A-M-E, as it is lumping everyone with any hint of colour in them all together. Um, because Alwyn and Stephen, you are not visibly black and you've also self-identified as, you know, um, other identities um, or other ethnic um, heritage, I thought it'd be great to just get your thoughts on them. So what are your thoughts on the term? Can we go with Stephen first? I told uh, a story recently where I was at a swimming pool and uh, a friend of mine who's Nigerian was trying to get my attention. He asked a white man to get my attention and the white man said to him, oh, you mean the black guy in the water? And my mother explained to me that for the majority of society, they won't really necessarily understand the nuances of race. And as long as you're not white, as far as they're concerned, you're black. I have always found labels about my racial identity problematic, especially when my mother's own mixed heritage um, as a Jamaican, uh, due to the colonial history, also involves Cuban heritage and Indian heritage. 
and um, my father's heritage also because the Portuguese uh, colonized parts of Asia involves Portuguese heritage. What I think is important is not really getting that attached to labels. I am more interested in the substance of what those discussions are when looking at um, how our lives are impacted in terms of the indicators of um, parity in terms of jobs, housing, healthcare, etc. As a, as a person who grew up in a society where classification was, was a major part of how the society was run and, and, and how, you know, like I said, hate was developed both in-group and, and, and intra-group at the end of the day, uh, I guess I can say to you, I, I hate when I came across the term BAME in the UK, I found it to be the most, um, I wouldn't use the word offensive, but it was the strangest term. I, I couldn't actually figure out what, what the word BAME was trying to do. And so I can honestly say to you, um, it's something that, that I, I, I don't like us using. I, I actually feel it, it undermines and it tries to create a uniformity across different racial groups. That, that might not be there. And, and you know, I, I'd say to you that, you know, I agree absolutely with what's, what Stephen says. You know, I, I do find labels problematic, you know. Um, and, and as somebody who identifies as being mixed race and, and, and so on, you know, it's, it's, it's something that has been used quite divisively in the way, in the way people groups have been tackled and, and challenged and actually, and actually supported. So, so I'm, I'm actually all for abolishing that term if I'm speaking quite frankly to you all. And, and I want to be called black or I want to be called mixed race and I, I want to get people comfortable with, with my color because that's an important part of my identity and who I am. Thanks very much, both of you. Um, just pulling some of the themes together, there's a lot of, there's there's a sense of action orientation and not getting caught up with um, symbolic work. So Afwa talked about, yes, it's great that you acknowledge your history, your your roots, your legacy, and your the ways in which you've contributed to the um, to to racism in in the past, as well as continue to perpetuate it now. Um, but what? actual action are you doing as an institution and Alwyn and Stephen have talked about how problematic um, in their views uh, this label is as the comment we heard from um, as I kind of was kind of quite raised in the in the question in the first place but there's certainly a sense of actually let's not get caught up too much by that term and and do the work required we are going to be ending with a call to action so uh, Lady Phil, I just want to kind of put you, give you a heads up for that. But before we do that, we will watch um, a closing video and then end with um, comments from Lady Phil and myself. recognize my privilege as the mother of a white 13 year old boy who I don't have to worry about being stopped by the police whereas my black friend and mother of a black 13 year old boy is preparing him for that very event. I recognize my privilege where I don't have to think or fear about how the color of my skin will impact me in any way. I can trust the police to be fair and reasonable with me. I recognize my privilege as I have no idea what it's like to be a person of color in this country but I've been out and witnessed racist comments and behaviours when I've been out with black friends and I find it completely unacceptable and sad. But at the same time, I was fully aware that the comments weren't directed at me. I recognise my privilege as someone who was born healthy, raised in a stable home by both parents. I could play as a child and concentrate on my education. I recognise my privilege as someone who is able-bodied. I don't usually have to plan ahead and nowhere is inaccessible for me. My middle class accent means that people look past any other signs of difference. I recognise my privilege as a man. I can walk the streets without fear of being sexually harassed. I recognise my privilege that I can talk freely to my colleagues about my social life without fear of judgement. As a Christian, my religion isn't seen as a threat. I recognise my privilege as a femme presenting, cisgendered, white lesbian who's much more easily accepted than other members of my LGBT plus family. 
I recognise my privilege as a man who is comfortable with gender identity. I don't have to worry about hiding a big part of myself or worry about the thoughts of others in order to live my life authentically. Phrases such as, you were born a man, therefore you are a man. Being straight allows me to be myself amongst other groups of men without a reaction. I recognise my privilege in that I have a twin brother who's gay and we get treated in very different ways because he has a male partner and I have a female one. I recognise my privilege as a straight female who can hold my partner's hand and without fear of attracting comment or attention. Having an English first name allows my CV to pass through more screening processes than some of my cousins. I recognise my privilege as a white person. I faced no questions during my naturalisation process as a British citizen. Because I came to the UK on a visa, people refer to me as an expat rather than an immigrant. As a white person with a British accent, nobody questions my right to live in this country. I recognise my privilege as being where I was born, to whom I was born, and the colour of my skin. At the same time, I feel very blessed um, to have met so many friends across the globe over the years um, that have been brave enough to have difficult conversations with me, that have opened my eyes to see the world through someone else's paradigm. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being with us um, and for reflecting, engaging, um, just kind of sitting with this conversation. As you all know, there's so many questions, so many different ways in which we could continue this conversation and many questions that we have been unable to answer. Um, the last point that we are going to be hearing is with regards to this call to action. And in some ways, I, I hope that many of you on the call will feel that that is addressing some of your questions around what can one do when one feels uncomfortable? What can one do when one observes behaviors? What can we do particularly when we notice our privilege? We will follow up um, on uh, any unanswered questions post-event with a survey. We will also address things like questions around um, sharing some of the definitions. We'll, we'll send that out. So we are taking note of those, um, even if we can't answer them here and now. And so I will pass to Lady Phil to share some thoughts um, with regards to the call to action, and then I will bring us to a close with some words as well. Lady Phil. Thank you. I, I hope you can hear me OK. I was um, furiously scribbling down what I really thought would be a, a good call to action. I think the conversation has been absolutely rich. You know, every all of the panelists have spoke so eloquently about their own stories, their lived experience and what is happening. And, you know, importantly, thank you to those, as you said, Doreen, for being on the on the call and on the line, you know, in the evening where we've all got things to do. But until we continue having these conversations, we will not usualize it. Some people use the word normalize. I use usualize because I don't quite know what normal looks like for somebody that carries or wears many different facets and um, is part of many different social categorizations. So what I, was, what I wrote down, and it's based around intersectionality. So intersectionality is often uh, used in a corporate world and a synonym for diversity, as I mentioned earlier on. You know, I hear people say nowadays, oh, but we have black women on boards and, you know, that should be enough and our board is intersectional because it may have a gay person, a black person, a disabled person, a young person. That doesn't mean it's intersectional. That may mean that it's diverse, but it doesn't necessarily change the issues of the discrimination that one may face within the workplace. 
So having a black woman at the table doesn't mean that it's feeding the most marginalized and bringing them forward to those who are left behind. And in my work, we have something called the SDGs, which are sustainable development goals. And one of them is about leaving no one behind. And that's what we've got to make sure we don't do. We don't leave anyone behind. So my call to action really to, to all of you is to go back and read or to start reading i've already mentioned Apple's book and it'll be great if after this meeting um that you can circulate the link uh, of the book so people can see and also to understand intersectionality and its origins of the five cases that were um that black women used to sue the general motors and this is a word coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, in 1989, and a term which was so important for many of us. So I think it's also important for us to um, think about our roles within organizations. I've mentioned policies that you have, procedures, and if they do not feel inclusive or about equity, about in, uh, diversity and equality, then sometimes you have to go and rip up those policies and start again. There's no point in just saying that we're going to have them there and we'll work on them. So you can start thinking about also what you're willing to make sure you use to elevate and amplify others. If you are a person that has recognized you have privileges in certain instances, how are you going to use that privilege where you have access to good health, housing, and so forth? And lastly, and closing on this, is, is we have to see enough meaningful change. And diversity and inclusion industry that has become profitable will no longer be necessary because we have created lasting change, but we can only do that when we do it together. We can only do it when we are having these uncomfortable conversations, where we are talking about the things that really others have not wanted to speak about. When we are looking at the stats in our workplace and your organization may be looking like a pint of Guinness where it's black and brown workers at the bottom and white senior leaders at the top. How do we stir this up and to make sure that we're not putting people in tokenistic positions, but we are addressing the inequalities within the workplace? How are we also making sure that this conversation is not just conversation and dialogue, but it has meaningful and tangible actions that follow. Things do not change unless there's an action behind it. Let's put the theory into practice, the practice into theory, and let's think about how we all support one another because we do not want to see the hands of time on equality being eroded as we're seeing for some of our most marginalized in society. So thank you for the opportunity to give a call to action. Thank you. Thank you, Lady Phil. Such an honor to um, hear you speak. And thank you to all of our other panelists. Afwa Hirsch, uh, wonderful to hear your stories and your the nuances. Stephen Liu, thank you for the complexities that you were bringing in terms of um, so naming class in terms of your profession, but also visible and invisible um, minority experiences. Alwyn, Thank you so much for your stories introduced in a different context with regards to some of these experiences that we are bringing alive on this call. Brian, it's been lovely, like I've, like I've said a number of times, um, collaborating with you on this. Uh, to the ICANN team, to all of the people kind of supporting us in the background, um, appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And I will just leave with um, just a couple more words and we will close. So to summarize, a call to action from me in, in many ways, picking on the threads that we've heard so far. Let us remember that privilege is invisible to those who have it. So therefore, 
when you hear a story or an experience, just because it didn't happen to you or anyone else you don't know, doesn't mean it didn't happen. When you observe injustice, dig in yourself to get the courage to speak out. And most significantly, think through practical opportunities in which you can step back and give voice, give power, and give opportunities to those who don't have what you do. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your evening wherever you are.